your technical issue and this will show as red. Now to introduce today's speakers, Robert and Glaber from the Federal University of Vizosa in Brazil. Gentlemen, I'm just going to pass the screen to you. If you could accept the invitation to present there while I complete your introduction. Now we are going to have our first double act in the webinar series today. You can see both of them there, I hope. So hopefully that goes well. Robert is a mycologist, Glaber is a forest pathologist, and they have both been working together on biocontrol in recent years. Now they do look slightly confused there, and I can't see your screen yet, boys. Can you see the invitation? Yes. Yes. Can, have you accepted the invitation to present? Here we go, it's coming in, this is good. Excellent. Now you should be able to begin your presentation and start talking to us about potential for hyperparasites to be used as a tool for controlling myrtle rust. I believe we're gonna hear from Robert first and then he's going to hand over to Glaber. Uh, to Glaber and I'll come in at the end of the presentation uh, for the questions. Are you ready there, Robert? Okay, can I start then? All right, thank you very much. Well, uh, I, will, I will start sharing my screen in a minute. Okay. No, but um, first I'd like to to thank uh, the land care team and the webinar organizers for for inviting me and Gleber to to present some of our, our work on this uh, challenging topic, which is uh, um, novel in many ways, which is the use uh, of natural enemies to attempt to resolve the, or to help to mitigate the myrtle rust crisis. So, um, okay, everyone seeing my screen? I hope so. Well, um, so the, we gave the 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 seminar this title chasing fungal antagonists of the myrtle rust fungus in brazil and uh we are i'm going to start by discussing some of the basics on uh okay so starting with the background why we got to this topic of uh, uh, chasing the, the myrtle rust uh, antagonists. First, the well, I've, I've been uh, a biocontrol scientist uh, for, for many decades already, and uh, my main topic has been weed biocontrol, but uh, in the, since 2015, I started also looking and studying and Publishing on biological control of uh, plant of fungal pathogens, particularly one. So the concepts behind biological control are very simple. Everybody knows it. It's uh, the use of uh, natural enemies to mitigate or to control weeds or or uh, nematodes or or arthropods or or any kind of pests and uh, and also to reduce the impact of invasive species. And classical biological control is uh, the use uh, of the natural enemies that uh, collected from the native range of invasive species and released to uh, reestablish the balance between the, the invasive species and the, the natural environment where they are occurring. So in a way, it's making invasive species uh, and their natural enemies to meet. Quite simple concept, and it works. So there are many examples for over a hundred years of uh, uh, the use of classical biocontrol. It all, unfortunately, doesn't always work, but uh, there are some spectacular stories. I won't go through all of them, um, but there are examples from agriculture, such as the use of uh, uh, parasitoids to control uh, the, the citrus miner in Brazil. This is a recent uh, example of success of, of, of classical biocontrol, an insect against another insect. 
Uh, one ongoing example is, in, is from New Zealand. It's a project that we've developed together with Landcare, and it's uh, aimed at uh, mitigating the invasion of Tradescanti of Tuminensis, a major uh, environmental wheat. And uh, we did our homework. We went to the field. We, col we found we collected many fungi. I will only work with fungi. And uh, we found this fungus, which is new. We described it as a new, new to science. We, we do that all the time. Many of the biocontrol agents that we find are, represent new fungal species. And the Codiana blood brasiliensis is not, uh, is, is just another example. And I, I grabbed these photographs from a, a Landcare report showing the before and after from a place where Codiana has been released less than one year later did the cleanup. And we are just hoping that this will continue and then that Pradescanti Fluminense eventually will, will be no longer be a problem in New Zealand. That's the idea of classical bio control. We only release agents which have been tested and proved to be safe. And so why it works, the concept is quite simple, but it has been published in the high profile journal, Trans in Ecology and Evolution in 2002, the fancy name, and then we release hypothesis. So uh, when you introduce uh, uh, some some of the species that are introduced uh, globally abroad, which transfer from one con continent to another, they can become invasive because the population go out of control. Sometimes it's because they lost their, their, the, the, the pressure of the burden of parasites. Strangely, it has never been attempted against invasive plant pathogens. And why? It's difficult to know, perhaps because it's too challenging. But eventually, we, sh we should address to this point, we biocontrol scientists. And we decided to do this. The first target that uh, we are aware of, of classical biocontrol uh, for, pl for, plant, for plant pathogens, with that, which shows Emilia vasatrix. It's the worst disease of coffee, well known throughout the world. Uh, and coffee, as you are aware, is the one of the top uh, agricultural commodities. And this is not a small thing. Emilia vasatrix devastated the coffee uh, plantations in in the in the 19th century in in, in the Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. It, the rust was first uh, known to occur in Africa, and it spread all over the, the world. Eventually, it arrived in Brazil in 1970. Uh, Brazil was and still is the largest coffee producer in the world. Uh, but many other countries, including very small countries, many small countries in Central America, depends on, on coffee as the main source of income, uh, main source of export. Management of coffee leaf rust has relied on fungicide applications, use of resistant varieties, and particularly in northern South America and in Central America, uh, the one strategy was escaping the disease by planting in highlands. So if you plant above 1,500, 1,700, the rust doesn't do any damage and coffee produces well. But each of these strategies have been facing major challenges. Fungicide applications are costly for smallholders. Are uh, If you apply fungicides, you lose your organic label, your the value of your crop is reduced. And the resistant varieties have been facing breakdown of resistance. Uh, one recent example is 2017, uh, the major uh, variety grown in Honduras, Lampira, had its resistance overcome by the rust. And every time this happens, is a disaster. Then escaping the disease through Highland plantations started failing because of global warming. So it's known that uh, in Central America, the, the mean temperature has raised to two degrees. That's enough for the rust to cl climb the mountain and start hitting the plants where the farmers were not prepared to, to have that kind of problem. The result was a disaster. And Guatemala announced the emergency, and the other countries in Central America followed the lead. And anywhere that 
anybody that watched the TV have seen this kind of scenario three years, four years ago, um, this uh, caravans of desperate families trying to cross Mexico and trying to go into the US. And we are also have seen the uh, big raise in violence in places like uh, El Salvador. And behind that is the coffee rush crisis and the, the loss of the, the main, one of the main sources of income. This is, a, a, because of all of that, uh, the several organizations, governmental, NGOs, uh, started moving, trying to find alternatives. There was clearly a need for plan B, and we suggested that the classical bar control might be this plan B. So we tried to sell the fish, and uh, it, we thought that perhaps if you look at, at the wild coffee in the center of origin, uh, we could find specialized co-evolved natural enemies. In our case, our interests are mycoparasites and endophytic, and endophytic fungi growing within coffee as bodyguards and working as bodyguards against rust. And we looked at the, in the literature and we found that the, and indeed there are at least two different species of mycoparasites on coffee leaf rust that only exist in, in, in Africa. Uh, one is Paranectriale, the other is the Digitopodium emilei. And we, yes, we found the, the resource and we went to Africa and we, we, we collected those two different uh, my, uh, mycoparasites. They are, are there and they are interesting. And the World Coffee Research is an NGO. We, we were very effective in obtaining the funds for us and we went to the field we went to Africa where we made contacts with people and with scientists, colleagues in several places in, in Africa, Cameroon, Ethiopia, particularly. And we uh, got uh, connections, established uh, uh, cooperation links with, uh, uh, with organizations in those countries, brought students from Africa in, to, and the scientists that went to the field with us, we collected in wild coffee as we planned inside the forest where there are patches of forest that you still find coffee growing. And uh, it was a, a bit of an adventure. We went to a few times to, to Africa and in the end, we obtained over 1,500 uh, 1, isolates. Half of them were, were selected for further study. And one of the impressive results is the diversity that we, that we found. We found around 90 different species of fungi growing either on coffee rust puzzles or growing inside coffee without causing any damage. So working perhaps as, a, as symbionts that might be helping to protect coffee. And we must say that uh, coffee leaf rust is not the top problem in, in coffee plantations in Africa. So this, this is a one example of a coffee that we, uh, specimen that we collected and we isolated from those plants and there were mycoparasites. Uh, and these are two examples of trichodermis. Uh, we got trichodermis, as you are aware, are, are, is a genus which contains many species which are amongst the flagship fungi used in biocontrol all over the world. And the list of trichodermis that we've obtained was quite impressive. We've obtained 16 different species, four of which were new to science. And when we do, in parallel, we did the same here in Brazil. So we went to, to, the, to coffee farms, abandoned coffee farms. We collected plants inside the forest that the, the bird wildlife brought the foods from the inside. And when we tried to isolate endophytes from them, there was nothing. We couldn't find a single trichoderma growing inside coffee. So there's a void of trichoderma. There is, there seemed to be a void of trichodermas in coffee in Brazil. And in big contrast to what we find in, in Africa. And trichoderma is, as I said, the flagship for the biocontrol industry. So we have to keep an eye on that. Well, we've been working for intensively for for all those years, and uh, our publications, our results are starting to appear in the 
in the literature and it's still very early. We have so many works that so many findings and it's really very exciting. And uh, at present, the, the, our project has revealed a very large diversity of potential antagonists uh, against uh, Imlea vastatrix. And uh, we did uh, uh, pro uh, some tests in, the, in under controlled conditions. Uh, we didn't find any obvious silver bullet agent that, that could do the job on its own. But there are many po uh, potential biocontrol agents that could have a, play a role in the future. So uh, uh, we need a long-term program. Uh, we are still far, far from, from having a solution in our hands, and, but everything is new. So this is a very challenging project and it's very, very, it's fascinating. For me as a mycologist, I, I love the project and I think there, there are so many interesting things that we've been finding that uh, it's really, I'm, I'm passionate by, with this project. And uh, we, so much that I, I convinced my colleague Glebe that uh, he should join in and we should try to have a, a look at the murder rust where because uh, in in his in this particular case we don't even need to go to africa to collect because murder rust occur just uh, out, outdoors so in our backyard there's murder rust and so what what if we look at murder rust so i'll pass on the uh, the ball to labor for him to to continue Hi everyone, uh, nice to be here. Uh, so uh, we started the, the project uh, on fungal antagonists of Australopsid in Brazil about four years ago. It had been doing, uh, we had been doing this research on our own with a limited research. So it is, it is a, a, at a slow, Pace. Uh, as uh, you here probably know, Alcipuxinia psidi was uh, originally described in Brazil in, eight, in 1884 in a municipality of São Francisco do Sul, as you can see here. So this Alcipuxinia psidi is considered is considered native to to Brazil and. Uh, uh, South, uh, South America and the Caribbean areas. So across the, the years, also Puxina PCD reached uh, different different uh, hosts in Brazil. Uh, I I'll show you here some um, minor uh, hosts that uh, don't have an uh, economically economic in, importance but uh, they host uh, the Australopuxina psidia. One of them is Jabuticaba. Um, the Australopuxina psidia infects uh, leaves and the fruits of this, uh, this species. By the way, it's very tasty. Uh, the other one is Eugenia florida. The, the Australopuxina psidia infects leaves of this species. Uh, pitanga, uh, the Australopuxina psid infects leaves and fruits. Mm -hmm. Here we have uh, rose apple, which is not native to Brazil, but uh, we have here a lot. Uh, it's uh, it's very uh, useful for multiplying uh, inoculum of uh, Australopuxina psid because of uh, its uh, uh, sus susceptibility, because it's uh, highly susceptible to also puxina seed. It's a plant that we inoculate. Well, uh, when it comes to hosts that are uh, economically important for us uh, in Brazil, uh, one of them is guava. It's considered the uh, uh, a top uh, uh, fruit crop in Brazil. Uh, also, Puxina seed infects, uh, infects leaves, uh, flower buds, and also young uh, 
Brutes disease is one of the worst diseases uh, in, for, for this uh, fruit crop. Well, the other uh, host that has um, uh, economic importance in Brazil is eucalyptus, which was a new encounter for Australopuxina psidi, considering that uh, eucalyptus is not native to Brazil. Uh, we had uh, a big problem in, this, the, in the 70s um, uh, when eucalyptus uh, plantation was were intensified in, in, in Brazil. The fungus infect young uh, tissues and also young plants. So the, the, the metal rust on eucalyptus occur, occurs uh, both in nursery and also in the field. Well, unlike New Zealand and uh, Australia, metal rust does not cause environment problems in Brazilian ecosystems. Uh, eucalyptus and, uh, and guava management rely on resistant genotypes and the fungicide, fungicide applications. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have um, uh, a product that you can use as a biocontrol against myrtorose in Brazil. Hopefully, we will be able to provide it. Well, the question uh, is, are there, are there fungal antagonists of myrtle rust in Brazil? Well, as you can see here, the answer is yes, there are. Uh, we did find a considerable diversity of the fungi on also coccinia PCD potions in different hosts, even though uh, we, we collect in a small area in Brazil in five neighboring municipalities in the state of Minas Gerais here, close to, our, the, close to the university where we work at. So the, the, the main species uh, of plant bearing colonized Postures was Pisidio guajava. Guava is very common uh, to find plants of guava colonized uh, with fruit, fruits colonized by different uh, fungi. Well, the, we we follow these steps these steps to identify to identify the the species of the the fungus, the fun the species of the fungi. Uh, of course, first we isolate uh, the, the fungi, we obtained uh, pure culture, we extracted the DNA, DNA ampli amplified, amplified and sequenced. We performed phylogenetic analysis and uh, also morphological characterization. Well, now I will, I will show you uh, the, the the natural enemies that uh, we 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 have found associated with Australopithecus in Brazil. We have a, here here a, a partial list with uh, some uh, genera. So because we, we are at a slow pace with this project, we uh, uh, until now, we we only um, look into some isolations that belong belong it to this uh, to this genera here: Cladosporio, Clonostax, Fusarium, Trichotesium, Trichoderma. Mm -hmm. Well, inside Cladosporium, we we found. Uh, Four different species: uh, Cladosporium anguloso, Cladosporium anthropophilum, Cladosporium pseudocladosporium, and also a, a species, 
a speech of Claudius Porro that is new to science that we 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 will be study and uh, describe this this species. So we also found clonostax, which is really uh, interesting because clonostax is a, a gen a genus that is considered uh, uh, a, bio, a biocontrol agent. So the species that uh, we we found uh, was clonostax vesicula. Uh, uh, we also uh, found tri uh, trichoderma, uh, trichoderma coningiops, uh, trichotestium, two isolates uh, is, uh, are inside the, the, the genus trichotestium and was, they were in, identified as trichotestium rosum. Well, we also uh, Inside uh, Fusari, we could uh, identify different species. Uh, as you can see here, the first one is Fusari the cellular. Uh, five, four isolates are inside this species. Um, Fusari Fujikoroi species complex. We have some isolates inside this uh, complex. Uh, the species uh, is Fusarium sterilifoso. We, the other complex is Fusarium fujicori, species complex. The species uh, that uh, our, our isolate um, belong is Fusarium pseudo circinato. Uh, Fusario incarnato exact, exact species com complex. Uh, inside this complex, we found the species Fusario lancernato. Fusario cisporum is species complex. So the species here is uh, Fusario mirembergiae. Fusario sambucino species complex. Uh, the species is Fusario aneniacum. Well, so the the next steps uh, we need to 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 follow is expanding the survey in Brazil to cover to cover new areas and additional also proxenepsid hosts. Uh, demonstrate the pathogenicity of potential antagonists to Australopithecinepsid. Evaluate the effect of potential antagonists against murderers. Uh, and the developing and the test a protocol for for evaluate the host specificity of osteopoxinapsid antagonists. Uh, as you you could uh, realize, uh, we we found uh, lots of fusaria. Uh, we we need to, to be careful yeah? and uh, to examine and uh, be sure that uh, these species. Uh, are not uh, pathogen to myrtle, metas, metarsal, metarsal species. Well, I would like to, to thank uh, the, uh, our team yeah, behind this work. We have uh, a great team. Uh, we are very lucky uh, here Priscilla, Nivia, Deborah, William, Luisa, Carlos, and Renata. And also, I, we would like to thank CAPS for providing fellowship for the students. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gleber and Robert. That was an excellent presentation. Can you see me thank there? Thank you. Can I stop sharing the screen? I think that would be fine. Okay. I can um, bring that back to me and we'll just see my my intro PowerPoint there, but I don't think that will be a problem. Here. No. Do get your questions in audience. Mm -hmm. 
I didn't see a question here. Oh, that's okay. I'm going to ask you the question. So uh, this this person would like to know whether you also are looking for uh, or find any bacterial species that could be control agents. Mm, bacterial species? Bacterial Perhaps species. Perhaps you could speak to coffee and myrtle rust with that question. Um, I'm sorry. I, I, can you repeat the question? I, I didn't really follow you up properly. Are you looking for bacteria as well as fungi? No, well, we, we didn't do any bacteria because we are not uh, uh, bacteriologists. We, we have to remain in our corner of uh, expertise. So I, I don't like bacteria, I like fungi. <laughs> I love your honesty there. <laughs> okay, next question. How will you show pathogenicity to a Pisidii? What are the standard, perhaps, protocols that you might be using? Well, these are very good uh, points. Uh, and uh, this is... Uh, uh, something that we are hoping to develop together with partners uh, in land care or uh, in other organizations. Uh, this is all uh, new. Uh, and uh, I, I, I don't think we, we, there are many examples of uh, 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 Cox postulates having been done with uh, mycoparasites, for instance. Uh, one, perhaps the First example was published by ourselves in a recent publication in iScience about one of the fungi that we found described on coffee leaf rust, which is uh, Calonectria uh, emilei. Uh, and we, we, we did perform uh, the demonstrations by inoculating uh, healthy coffee plants waiting for the rust to develop, pure pustule, rust pustules, and then we inoculated the rust pustules and expected until it gave the, condi the provided the conditions necessary for the, the mycoparasite to develop. And then we re-isolated from the pustules and we observed, we found colonies of uh, Calonectria on the pustules and we re-isolated and we, have, we obtained pure, pure cultures. So this is a classical method for fulfilling the Cox postulates. So it, it is possible to do. And we got also further evidence by uh, running scanning electron microscopy studies with those uh, inoculated rust postures. So we got um, evidence that uh, this fungus is in, indeed a mycoparasite. Uh, is it questionable? Well, maybe. I think we, there are improvements that needs to be done. But uh, this is an all uh, new, and uh, this, uh, uh, the, even the methodology we, we may need to refine. So this is a it's a good thing that uh, doing science uh, on the on the frontier is uh, it's very it's fascinating, but it's also very challenging. It sounds like you took a very thorough approach there. So we do have a couple more questions, so we'll keep going here. Um, really fascinating talk. Yeah, you guys did a great job there, for sure. Um, and this is something I was thinking about as well. Uh, these uh, hyperparasite species, typically host specific, um, and is there any way you can tell are they also endophytes of plants, endosymbionts, parasites? I mean, are there any kind of general rules for the species that you've been finding? Uh, or do they represent a whole range of operations and meshes across the fungal kingdom? Yeah, well, <clears throat> yeah I believe that uh, we are... Uh, well, it, one fascinating thing is the diversity is so huge. In fact, 
I, 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 my impression was when we started looking at this, the, the fungi that we collected in, in, in coffee leaf rust is that there are more patheg fungal pathogens attacking the rust that they are attacking the coffee plants. Amazing. It's just a, such a tiny uh, target. It's amazing. So I think that the, the, there's a huge diversity and each of these fungi that we've found needs uh, to, the story is our represents a story that needs to be sold, uh, told. We don't know exactly how they perform and we uh, some of them may be just sitting there, some may be waiting for a chance. We use the, the brush uh, lesions to get into the plant. Maybe they are secondary. Some are, may be secondary pathogens of the coffee plant or of the eucalyptus or the guava or so and some may just be um, necrotrophs that uh, uh, survive on dying uh, spores of the of the rust uh, and but certainly some of them are aggressive uh, mycoparasites and some may both be endophytic and mycoparasitic that's the case of uh, I, I would expect that some of those uh, trichodermas that we've obtained, they, they have the ability to grow inside healthy plants as well. Maybe, it's just a speculation, maybe they will be able to work as bodyguards and protect plants that uh, were inoculated by, by them. But all, all of that are possibilities that uh, await being tested and explored. Excellent, and we've still got some uh, good questions coming in, including from some of my other webinar presenters and attendees, so that's terrific. Now we have a question about Ape City Eye itself. So thinking about uh, the Myrtle Rust isolates you got from the different plant species in Brazil, did you do uh, genetic analyses of them uh, and do you see them being from the same genetic cluster? Oh, uh, we too we have been uh, noticed that there is no rule. Uh, we have some uh, isolates that share the same cluster, uh, but uh, yes, it's not a rule. Uh, they can be in the same and also in different genetic, genetic cluster. Okay, I think that's that's well answered there. Are the coffee rust pathogens native species that have switched host? Uh, I, 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 I see, yeah, you spoke really about just the one pathogen there, the Hemelia. Uh, uh, I know that it came from Africa, uh, so maybe not well, here. Uh, well, uh, it's too early. Uh, that it's still it's impossible to, to respond to a question like that. It's, it's, we need to to understand and learn better uh, whether the what's the whole strange for for the those mycoparasites or, or are they capable of uh, attacking other uh, uh, fungi besides coffee leaf rust or, or the, these are, are and we need to re reinvent ourselves because it has been used as biocontrol scientists to test different plants in the centrifugal phylogenetic uh, 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 protocols but uh, nobody has ever done that for for the pathogen of a fungus uh, how do we do that now uh, i don't know it's Yes. Something that we will need to address, and uh, and uh, in order to to become convinced that uh, we are dealing with safe biocontrol agents and biological control, classical biological control is depends. The cornerstone of classical biological control is uh, clarifying host range. So we need to do that. I don't know how we are going to do that. No, but uh, we, I, I hope that the, our friends in land care will guide us or resolve that. So the board, for sure, if, for sure. I definitely love to be speaking with you gentlemen again. 
All right, another question. Now we're moving into more this applied end with this question. Um, and I have a question about that myself. So let's chat about this now. So do you think the mycoparasites would be able to establish themselves within the leaf microbiome? So basically become a self-sustaining method or do you think we'd need to keep adding spores onto the leaves over time? I, I suspect that's another thing that's really hard to answer, but have you had any thoughts about that? One thing that I, 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 did like, I would like to comment is that uh, the same scenario that we had for trichodermas in Brazil, absent in, Brazil, in coffee plants in Brazil, and very ab abundant in coffee in in the wild uh, um, situations in Africa. Uh, it's it seems from what Alana uh, has done with her team, it seems that the same thing is happening with the coffee with the myrtle rust. So we have without much effort, we found a big diversity of uh, myrtle rust antagonists, potential antagonists around here. And when Alan and her team went to to, to see whether there was uh, something growing on the uh, myrtle rust pustules in New Zealand, there was nothing. So, and uh, so there's a void of, yes. of agents. Yes, and, and I it, guess- it, This is, is proven, proven true. Uh, there's clearly something missing there. So the burden of parasites is not there for the myrtle rust. So that's that's very encouraging. I'm not yes, responding I, I guess... the question. I'm sorry, I didn't yeah, have to respond yeah. the question. Uh, uh, what I think is yeah. that the, what I think is that the, the in in some cases, particularly in agricultural situations, it's very likely that the we find the, some of the agents we're going to find, uh, you need to treat them as uh, biopesticides. Yeah. So you need to repeat applications to protect the crop. Yeah. That's interesting. Yes, I see, I see um, you ran out of time there in your talk to mention Alana's work, but just yeah, so the audience is aware, we have had a preliminary look down here in New Zealand for hyperparasites on myrtle rust and not found a whole lot, that's for sure. So I did just have one question of my own and then I think uh, we'll see if anything else comes in, but we're nearly ready to finish up here. So you showed us a number of trichodermic, trichoderma products already available uh, and I wondered if you think they have any promise for coffee leaf rust or even for myrtle rust and do you intend to test any of those commercial products that already exist? Well, uh, I, I don't know if I got, uh, understood it well but uh, let's see. Uh, you, you, your, questioning, your question is whether there are already products available in the market for the biocontrol of coffee leaf rust and how they compare with the, with the trichodermas that we've, we've, we've been finding. That's your question. Yeah, could you just, are, are you going to test what we can already buy? Do you think we might already have a product on the marketplace that would work? Well, that's a that's a, a good point. There's nothing registered, at least in Brazil, there's nothing registered uh, and available for the farmer to buy and apply against coffee leaf rust in Brazil. And no trichoderma products have ever been registered for the biological control of coffee leaf rust. There are some bacteria. There are bacteria-based products, products, not many, but I, I'm not uh, I'm not sure whether they are a success story. Um, okay, but would you like to test some? Would you be interested in testing or do you think it's smarter just to focus on fungi on the plant to hand? <laughs> would you like to test any of those if you had the funds? I'd like to taste some. 
big one. So if you have fun, would you like to taste to test to, to test it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, to test the uh, the existing products, the trichoderma products that are already available in the market, and to come to see whether they would work against the rust. Well, I, I think that I think the companies have already pro probably have already done that because coffee rust is such a, a high profile uh, disease, uh, particularly in Brazil, where where uh, coffee is such a huge pro, uh, crop that I, I I I don't know I could I could ask uh, I should have asked in fact to, to, to the companies because some of the largest biocontrol companies are already in Brazil and they are doing very well so okay. they, they they could be uh, they, they they would be the first to be interested in registering their own products against such a high profile target as coffee leaf rust. I don't know whether they are, they have uh, something on the pipeline, uh, or or whether they've already tested the, the trichodermis that they do have and they are not doing so well. Our focus for the coffee leaf rust project has never has not really been on developing a product. It's it has been more on trying to find a classical biocontrol agent that could be released into Central America. To control and to mitigate the humanitarian crisis there, that was our our main goal. Yeah, fascinating to be reminded of the profound social implications that plant diseases can have, and the complexity of uh, human migration and drivers of that that are not often accurately portrayed in the media. So very uh, worthwhile for you to remind us and to keep reminding the world um, at every opportunity how important these issues can be. So I have a couple quick comments and then I'll wrap this up uh, where someone would like to see slides of previous research on the subject. We are going to wrap up now but you will have a recording of this webinar available to you if you'd like to review any of the slides and actually my own PhD supervisor, Peter Johnston, would like to say hi to Robert. So he's been with us this morning and I'm sure he's enjoyed your talk very much. So that is it for today. And yes, the uh, webinar recording will be circulated in the next couple of days and it will also uh, be on the Beyond Myrtle Rust website. We have them on YouTube. It just takes me a few days sometimes to get that organized. Now the next webinar will be on Wednesday, July 13th, and we will hear from Richard Snesko, a geneticist with the US Forest Service. Now his talk is titled, Finding and Developing Genetic Resistance to Disease in Forest Trees. So it's basically breeding for resistance. Certainly a pertinent topic for myrtle rust management, um, an alternative approach, I guess, to what we have heard today and certainly something we hope can be long lasting. So do look out for that invite in a couple of weeks. And that's it for today, everybody. Hi, and I'll see you next time.